So Apple have just announced a new 2020 edition of the MacBook Pro 13 inch. What's changed? And if like me, you've got one of the previous edition models, is it worth upgrading to the new one? Let's find out. Now I'm filming today from my office, which is in a very rural location and the, the business park is pretty much closed. There's nobody here. So you'd think it would be really quiet. And you'd be wrong because there's just a constant stream of traffic going past the building. And uh, it's also raining today, of course, because it's England. So it just makes the noise even worse. So uh, apologies for any audio interruptions. Now let's get to it with this MacBook Pro 13 inch. I've always really loved the 13 inch form factor for a notebook. I like the portability, I like the size, but it's very difficult to get a lot of power into such a small computer. That said, I've not been disappointed at all with the performance of my top spec 2018 model. Would I consider upgrading for the new one? Let's have a look at the Apple website and see what's changed. So first of all, Apple are advertising 10th generation processors with this up to 80% faster graphics performance. I feel this is slightly misleading because only the top end models have the 10th generation processors. The entry level model is still the 8th generation processor. Uh, and nothing wrong with that, of course. Uh, you'll notice we can now go all the way up to 32 gigabytes of memory. But again, I think that only applies to the top specification notebooks. And the other big change is the Magic Keyboard. So this is the new generation of keyboard that already appears on the MacBook Pro 16 inch. And they've now put that keyboard onto the MacBook Pro 13 inch. It offers better key travel and a better typing experience. There's a lot of hatred for Apple's butterfly keyboard. Um, I'm not a big fan of the typing experience either, but like many people, I've gotten used to it over time. But there's also been a lot of reports of the fragility of these keyboards. They seem to have a lot of problems. They don't last long and they're not very easy to replace either. But I have to say, I've never experienced any issues. And I was just thinking about how many of these laptops we've got in our web studio of this generation where there's a butterfly keyboard. And I think it's about 15 of them. And over the last, what, two years or so, we've not had any staff complain of issues with their keyboard. So your mileage may vary, of course, but uh, the new Magic Keyboard is definitely a step up. It is a much better typing experience. If you do a lot of typing, it may be important to you to have that newer keyboard. Apple here is uh, advertising the notebook as being a portable powerhouse, something you can uh, take out with you and do some editing. So they're talking about retouching and editing your work in Affinity Photo. Um, I have to say, I use Affinity Photo and here at the web studio, we switched over from Adobe to Affinity about three years ago and we've never looked back. It's a really great piece of software. I do edit photos in Affinity Photo on my MacBook Pro 13 inch, uh, although most of the time when I'm doing it, I'm plugged into an eGPU. Uh, the other example they give here is Coding, uh, running virtual machines, obviously more power, more memory, more virtual machines, that's important to coders. And also the small form factor is always very popular with developers. Video editing, um, I'm not sure how great the experience will be. I have edited videos on my MacBook Pro uh, 13 inch without having it plugged into the eGPU. It's a pretty torturous experience with your legs getting cooked by the heat of generated by the laptop. Um, but it is certainly possible. Uh, so faster graphics performance would certainly be welcome for doing any kind of Final Cut Pro work. Uh, I can definitely see musicians going after the 13 inch MacBook Pro as well. It's a great thing, particularly to use on stage, but also for mobile recording as well. And if you can now have up to 32 gigabytes of RAM, uh, that's a big plus. Uh, Apple includes gaming here, but uh, does anybody really buy an Apple notebook to, to do gaming on? I don't think so. So they keep talking about more power in the cores of the, the CPU, but again, it's only those top models that get the 10th generation CPUs. According to reports, the top CPU, the i7 quad core build to order option in the 13 inch MacBook Pro is the i7 1068NG7. Uh, this apparently runs at 2.3 gigahertz with a 4.1 gigahertz turbo. This is a very new CPU, so there aren't any published benchmarks for it yet. Uh, so I can't tell you what the performance is like compared to the previous quad core i7s. Uh, my expectation is that it's probably uh, not that different for CPU performance only. It's the graphics performance where it will really push ahead. 
Of course, on those top models, the RAM is also at running at a faster frequency, so that will impact the overall performance of the computer. Now, the new 10th generation CPUs feature Iris Plus graphics, the latest generation, whereas the older versions have the Iris Plus 655 in them. Now, what they're saying here is for gaming performance, it's 80% faster. So that's a fairly significant upgrade uh, if you are using your Mac for gaming. I'll come across to the Affinity Photo comparison here. And what you'll see is that they're suggesting there's 25% faster image processing, but they're not specific about what that is. So we've got a little number nine there. Let's just scroll down to the bottom of the web page and see if we can find what that means. It just says that uh, Affinity Photo 1.8.3 tested using the built-in benchmark and Val Dorsier sample image. So that means nothing to me. It maybe perhaps means something to you. What's interesting here is the comparison they do for Final Cut Pro. And that what they're saying is it's 60% faster. I mean, if you just glanced at that, you'll go, oh, well, brilliant, 60% faster than the previous generation. But then underneath it says for 3D title rendering. Um, I don't think I've ever rendered a 3D title in Final Cut Pro. It's not the sort of thing that tends to feature on Pro videos. Um, obviously, rendering motion graphics, um, you want your CPU to be as fast as possible with that. Uh, background rendering, you want to be as quick as possible as well. And of course, the final render. And it would be really useful to have some kind of rendering performance comparison. Uh, we could actually use that to make an assessment of whether this is uh, actually a faster machine or not. The idea that the new 2020 MacBook Pro 13 inch will be 60% faster in Final Cut Pro across the board is just nonsense. That's never gonna be the case. I'm really frustrated at the moment with Final Cut Pro because the, the rendering performance seems to be all over the place. Uh, on my Mac Pro, it can't seem to use both of the graphics cards properly. If you plug in an eGPU, it just completely ignores it. Uh, quite often, it tries to render on the CPU and it completely ignores the graphics cards. Uh, same story on the MacBook Pro. Tried to render a video last night. It started off rendering it on the eGPU and then partway through just stopped and started using the internal iris graphics and everything slowed down to a crawl. Uh, I don't understand any of this. I don't know what Apple's playing at, but there's some significant problems with Final Cut Pro at the moment. It seems to me that they're focusing on optimizing the performance for their new 2019 Mac Pro and anyone who's on a different machine, they don't really seem to care about. Uh, so onto the SSD storage, we can now have up to four terabytes of storage. And Apple are saying that you get up to three gigabytes a second on speed. Uh, let's just test the SSD in my 2018 edition using a Blackmagic disk speed test. So you see that I'm running about two and a half gigabytes a second there on write and just shy of that again on read performance. So we're talking about a fairly reasonable upgrade to the performance of your SSD. Whether you'll actually see that performance difference in real-world tests, that's another question entirely. Um, in fact, once your SSD gets up above sort of 600 megabytes a second, it's quite difficult to tell uh, the difference in speed unless you're actually just copying huge files all the time, uh, which is not really representative of most people's workflow. In any case, it's great to have really fast performance, and it's really good that you can get up to four terabytes. Uh, in a moment, we'll have a look at the um, purchasing page and see just how much it costs you to add four terabytes of storage. I expect that won't be cheap. Here they're talking about that magic keyboard again. You'll notice as well that the arrow keys have been changed back to the old design where you had the small left and right arrow keys. And I think I prefer that to the arrangement that's on my 2018 edition. Uh, some more marketing information about the touch bar. I don't know about you guys, but I don't really find the touch bar to be particularly useful. Um, I would really like it if Apple sold a MacBook Pro without the touch bar, but with the four Thunderbolt ports, that would be useful for a lot of people. I probably spend half my time with my laptop plugged into a monitor and I might have the laptop on a stand out of reach anyway. So the touch bar is fairly pointless for me. And that is the setup that we have here in the web studio. Uh, all our guys have either one or two external monitors and they have their laptop on a stand. So as far as I'm aware, none of us ever use the touch bar. It's a bit of pointless technology, uh, something that can go wrong and it just doesn't need to be there. Just give us a notebook with function keys uh, and a fingerprint reader, that would be great. Of course, you have the T2 security chip in all new Macs and the, this is basically an ARM CPU that uh, takes care of the encryption and decryption of 
files on your hard drive so that that load isn't on the CPU. That helps to speed up the system. Uh, but they also use it to do some other things as well, uh, particularly encoding and decoding certain types of video. And we've got some information about the display and the audio, but as far as I'm aware, these haven't changed at all since the previous generation. And we still have the Thunderbolt 3 ports. You'll either get two on the lower specification or four on the higher specification machines, and you do get a, a headphone jack as well, which I think doubles up as a microphone jack. Uh, you can charge the MacBook from any of those ports. Uh, you get a USB-C type charger, doesn't matter which socket you use, that'll work fine. Now you notice here that Apple are featuring the fact that you can connect this laptop up to an eGPU. And Apple continually are advertising eGPU as a solution for their products, uh, particularly the Mac Mini and all of their notebooks that don't have discrete graphics cards. And yet my experience with the eGPU is that Apple's apps don't properly support it. Uh, we've already spoken about Final Cut Pro, that's all over the place with eGPU at the moment. I think what I would say about eGPU is if you definitely need graphics performance all the time and you need it in Final Cut Pro, eGPU is probably not the right solution for you. Uh, buy a Mac that's got graphics power built into it. So that additional graphics power that we've got now allows you to connect a 6K display, and that includes Apple's Pro XDR display, if you wanted to go down that route. And now we're just talking about functions that are available with Catalina. So we've got Sidecar where you can use your iPad as a, as a second screen and use the Apple Pencil to mark up content and those kind of things. That just gives us an overview of how Apple's trying to sell this notebook. And for the uninitiated, you could read this page and assume that across the board, you've got 60 to 80% performance improvement over the previous generation. And that's simply not going to be the case. Um, we'll have to wait until we can get some benchmarks done, but I don't believe it's gonna be anywhere like 60 to 80% across the board. I expect on some things it'll be a bit slower, on other things it'll be a bit quicker. It's the usual sort of story when you change a generation of CPU. CPU performance isn't accelerating at the rate that it once did. So these new generations often just improve power draw, uh, they might improve the thermal performance of the CPU. So overall you do get better performance, but it's not like night and day performance from one generation to the next. So let's now just go through the purchasing process and have a look at some of the specifications and what they cost. So as before, we've got four off-the-shelf specifications which you can then customize. So let's start with the, the very cheapest one. So in this one, we get a 1.4 gigahertz quad-core i5 processor. Iris Plus Graphics 645, we've got eight gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage. So that's gone up, it used to be 128. And you only get two Thunderbolt 3 ports with that particular model. And in the UK, that comes in at 1,299 pounds. Now, prices in different countries obviously will vary. Uh, something you need to know in the UK is that includes our sales tax, which we pay on pretty much everything of 20%. Uh, so if a business is buying this and they're registered for VAT, they'll get it for 20% less. But consumers always pay that price, including VAT. So £1,299. So the next model that's on offer is basically the same machine, but it has 512 gigabytes of storage. Then we go up to the models with four Thunderbolt 3 ports. And you'll notice that there's a difference in the speed of the RAM here. So first of all, we've got the 10th generation processors, so a 10th generation quad-core i5. You get the new Iris Plus graphics. Notice the RAM now runs at 3,733 megahertz, and you get 16 gigabytes as standard. That always used to be eight gigabytes. The 16 gigabyte was always a build-to-order option. So uh, that's a big improvement. And also, you get 512 gigabytes on your SSD as standard, and that's coming in at £1,799. And the fourth model that they're offering is basically the same thing, but with one terabyte of SSD storage. So what we've really got is two models. We've got one that has just two Thunderbolt 3 ports, and the other has four Thunderbolt 3 ports. Uh, with the base model, you're getting an eighth generation Intel processor, you're getting slower RAM, in the improved model, you're getting the 10th generation Intel processors with that improved graphics performance. You're getting faster RAM and more of it. So let's go back to the base model, the very cheapest one, and let's see what our upgrade options are. So we've got an upgrade option of a 1.7 gigahertz quad core eighth generation i7, uh, which advertises a turbo boost of four and a half gigahertz. I expect this is a lower wattage processor, so that probably means better battery life in the uh, lower model. It also means that that turbo boost probably won't be active for as long before the CPU starts to thermal throttle. So 
I don't know whether that's worth £300 as an upgrade. You'll notice that we can go from 8 gigabytes to 16 gigabytes for £100. Now that used to be £200, so it's nice to see that that price has come down. In fact, £100 for 8 gigabytes of memory, you know, that's, that's bordering on reasonable, reasonable RAM pricing from Apple. Who'd have thought it? Uh, I would say that's a definite, you need to do that. If you're buying a, a computer with a pro label on it, put 16 gigabytes of RAM in it, for goodness sake. Uh, 256 gig of storage, that's probably enough for, for many people, depending on what you're doing. If you're storing all of your files on your hard drive, then obviously you're going to need possibly some more storage. And the options go up in 200 pound increments. So to go up to two terabytes, which is the maximum on that base model, we're looking at an additional 800 pounds. I wouldn't have said that's worth it at all. I would get an external SSD drive Samsung T5 probably for 200 pounds. You can certainly get a one terabyte Samsung T5 and have a bunch of change. And they run pretty rapidly, about 500 megabytes a second, which is plenty quick enough. Uh, I actually use my Samsung T5s with my MacBook Pro. Even though I've got the one terabyte SSD, I edit my video typically on a Samsung T5 drive. Uh, that allows me to swap between my MacBook Pro and my Mac Pro. And I've never noticed any performance issues with that. Uh, I like having a terabyte on board though because it enables me to copy files and use that as temporary storage and that's really useful. Uh, but any files that are important to me, I'm not going to keep them on my notebook. All of that's in the cloud or it's on my NAS drive system and it's all backed up. Uh, I don't put anything that's important on my, my notebook computer because if it gets lost or stolen or damaged, um, you are stuffed. Particularly with these MacBooks because the SSD is tied to the T2 chip so it's very difficult for you to retrieve your data uh, if you damage your notebook. Let's go and have a look at the, the top model now and see what we can spec that up to. So if we take that top off the shelf model, we're at £1,999 and we're getting a quad core i5, 16 gigs of RAM and a terabyte of storage. Now the 2019 MacBook Pro 13 inch, uh, the very top specification you could buy was uh, £2,699 and that got you basically the same spec but with a, an i7 instead. So let's upgrade to an i7. So that's an extra 200 pounds to go up to the 2.3 gigahertz i7. We've got that lovely fast 3,733 megahertz RAM, 16 gigs of it. And Apple want a whopping 400 pounds for that additional 16 gig. So I take back everything I said about Apple having reasonable RAM upgrade prices. This is just the way it normally is with Apple. Um, but you cannot upgrade the RAM yourself. It's soldered onto the board. so. If you need 32 gigs, you've got to, you've got to pony up 400 pounds. Uh, I would just bear in mind though that obviously the 32 gigabyte model is going to hold its value. So yeah, it's expensive at the outset, but when you come to move on the laptop in three years time or whenever you, you upgrade, you will get you know more money back. So it may be worth doing. And we've got one terabyte of SSD storage, which is you know fantastic. Uh, we can jump up to two terabytes for another £400 and that four terabyte option is going to cost us a whopping £1,000. So that means that you can spend £3,599 on a MacBook Pro 13 inch without discrete graphics. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that, that's quite strange. That's a lot of money to pay for a laptop of that specification. I expect most people wouldn't spec up a 13 inch MacBook Pro like this. So should you upgrade? If you've got uh, an earlier edition of the MacBook Pro, should you be considering an upgrade? Uh, well, I think if you've got uh, the 2018 edition or the 2019 edition, then I'd say probably not, unless you've got a very specific need for one of those new features. I suppose if you've got an entry-level model and you do a lot of typing, the Magic Keyboard is really important to you. It's conceivable that you might want to upgrade to have that better experience but it's not worth it for the specifications because they haven't really changed that much. And what about if you've got one of the higher specification models? So I got the 2018 edition and I actually bought this new only in January of this year. Every time Apple does an upgrade and changes the model number, then you find that uh, resellers who have loads of stock of the old models have to ship that stock out and they'll sell it off cheaper. And it just so happened that a big education supplier had a whole bunch of these top specification 2018 editions. So I got mine for uh, less than 1800 pounds, whereas the 2019 model was 2700 pounds for the same thing. In fact, the, the only difference is uh, the CPU was ever so slightly faster 
on the 2019 edition. But we're talking minuscule differences that you'd never notice. So I managed to save myself almost a thousand pounds by buying a computer like that. And I think the same thing might actually be true at the moment. You might be able to now start picking up the 2019 models a lot cheaper, and that represents great value for money. This particular update seems to be a bit of a halfway house. I expect next year they'll release the 14-inch MacBook Pro, and at that point they might then bring the 10th generation CPUs to the lower specification models. Uh, so if that's what you particularly want, then perhaps hold off for another year um, or shop around for a bargain. Uh, some people hold off buying Apple products because they're always conscious that there might be a, a newer and more exciting product just around the corner. And Apple are very good at you know, keeping tight-lipped on announcements for their new products. And then suddenly they arrive, uh, usually the week after you've caved in and bought the previous generation model. It always seems to happen to me anyway. Um, but I would say, don't worry about that. Don't sit around waiting. If you need a computer, just buy the one that you need and that's gonna work for you. And I tend to think about a three-year upgrade cycle for my notebooks anyway. So if you're working on that cycle, then you know that in three years time, you'll have a newer and more exciting notebook. So I think it's good with the new MacBook Pro 13 inch that they've put that new keyboard in. I don't think the base models hold much excitement for me. Uh, the more powerful models are a bit more interesting, but I'm gonna reserve my judgment until we start to see some benchmarks coming through for those processors. Uh, and then perhaps I'll make another video. And in the meantime, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, please hit the button and tap that bell icon if you wanna be notified whenever I release new content. And maybe I earned a thumbs up. In any case, I'll see you next time for some more geekery.